Nina for her time in preparing this for us. Um, I can go ahead and introduce you, Marina, if that's okay with you. And while we do the introductions, maybe we have somebody else joining. As I said before, my name is Carolina Sumailini. I'm an Education USA advisor based in Argentina. And we wanna welcome everybody and especially uh, Marina Pasos, who is the International Enrollment Manager for Latin America, Caribbean and Europe from Northeastern University. And she will be speaking to us about the importance of a personal statement in the application process to um, US higher institutions. And she will be offering some tips on best ways to navigate this uh, stage of the process. As you might know uh, or not, uh, we are from Education USA, which is a network of the Department of State of the US with centers in over 170 countries. We aim to provide and promote US uh, higher education by offering you accurate, precise, and up-to-date information. Um, we really want to thank you for your time and for your interest in, in joining on this event. And now I'm going to give the floor to Marina. Um, just one quick thing before we start. Uh, we are recording the session. We're going to make this available to you. So in case you don't want anybody to see you, we recommend you turn off your camera and also be aware to keep your microphones off. Uh, during the presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as Carolina mentioned, my name is Marina Passos. I'm part of the International Enrollment Management Team at Northeastern University. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to talk about the significant part of the application process, which is the statement of purpose. So thank you, Education USA. I'm really happy to join you today. Uh, so you may be sitting there and thinking about applying to a graduate program overseas, uh, feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the idea of writing an essay in English that will hold a significant weight on your application. And now you might be thinking, so how do I make it perfect? So during this session, we will provide gen general information about admissions requirements and just a general overview of the whole applica application process. Uh, it's important to mention that admissions requirements vary by university, college, and program that you are interested in. So please check your program of interest and your University of Choice website just for more information on specific requirements. I hope that everyone can see my screen. Could you just confirm? Mm, yes, right. Okay, thank you. So this is an overview of what we will discuss in the next minute. So we'll be talking about Northeastern University and why apply for a graduate program in the US, general admissions requirements, of course, the statement of purpose itself. Uh, we are gonna be talking about admissions review and also we will give you some suggestions and tips to write your statement of purpose. So just to give you some brief information about Northeastern. So Northeastern University is a tier one research university that offers a unique education model that integrates rigorous academics with experiential learning. So Northeastern is currently ranked number 49 among US national universities and also number one for co-op and internships. And we'll be talking about co-op and internships in a bit. Um, the university, um, has over 3,000 employer partners around the world and over 10,000 students uh, participating on co-op each year. So we offer both undergrad and graduate programs across our campuses in the United States and also in Canada and London, the UK. So our main campus is located in Boston and the picture that you see here is actually a picture of the campus. So it's quite close to downtown Boston, really, a really, really big campus surrounded by restaurants, shops and cafes. So it's a really great destination if you're looking for uh, cultural activities and a really, really um, university city. We do also have a graduate programs in San Francisco, San Jose, Seattle, Portland in Maine, uh, Vancouver, Toronto, and in London as well. And all of those campuses, they are open to international students. All right. Okay, so let's get to the bottom of it. So uh, one of the main advantages of studying in the United States 
is a UK name for highly ranked world universities. So this means access to great academic education, to universities that have great facilities and up-to-date academic resources. And besides, the number of programs which are available is much higher than what we are used to in Latin American countries uh, in general. And also, as the workforce evolves, a graduate degree shows that you are dedicated and that you are committed to enhancing your industry expertise and credibility. So also earning a master's degree can help you gain specialized knowledge in your field of studies, which actually helps you become more competitive in that particular field. And also don't forget that by attending a program outside your home country can help you develop cert certain soft skills, which are really high on demand nowadays, uh, especially adaptability. We've seen that a lot on the past few years, especially because of the pandemic and everyone had to adapt at some point to some things, either being working from home or working with different platforms and all of that. But also flexibility, communication skills, uh, problem solving skills, team working, just to name a few. And networking. So of course, you will meet lots of domestic and also international students during your studies in the United States. And also you will be able to connect with faculty members, staff members in general, and it will allow you to network with your peers. So networking can actually strengthen business connections, uh, can help you get career advice and support, can help you even get some fresh ideas by communicating and participating in discussions with others. And of course, employment opportunities. So as I mentioned, we are number one for co-op and internships and we are really proud of that. So F1 student visa holders, they are eligible for the co-op program and also OPT. So first of all, co-op. So co-op is actually an educational program in which students alternate periods of academic study with periods of employment in the field that they are learning in the class, that they are studying at the university. So it's an opportunity for you to take to the field what you are learning in the classroom, all right? So most positions are actually paid positions and they are full-time positions. Uh, and also there is OPT, which means the optional practical training. That program actually allows F1 visa holders to remain in the United States up to three years working on their related field of studies. So those are also great opportunities for international students. Uh, we are not really here to talk about them, especially specifically, so we can actually have another, <laughs> another session just to talk about um, employment opportunities in the US. It's just to give you some brief information about, about it, all right? Okay. So, um, just one second, there you go. So when you start your application process, you will notice that some documents uh, which are requi required are just the standard documents. The ones which other students might also have the same results as you, we call those hard data, all right? So you have no control under the hard data. And those includes your transcripts, your test results. Um, when I say test results, it can be TOEFL, IELTS, PTE, Duolingo, GMAT, GRE, so test results, and your resume. On the other hand, there are a few documents which you have total control of. No other applicant will have the same document as you, and we call them soft data. Those are the statement of purpose and recommendation letters. So those are the ones that will differentiate you from other candidates. So you may, uh, let's say, have the same GPA, you may have the same TOEFL scores, you may have worked on the same company, but you will never write the same statement of purpose, you will never provide the same recommendation letters as the other candidate. And of course, this statement of purpose is one of the most important components of your application. So that's what we are here to, to help you write your statement of purpose. And what do I need to include? Do I need to make it personal or do I need to make it professional? So how do I actually write it? So first of all, 
uh, a statement of purpose is actually um, well sometimes you can uh, you can see it, uh, people calling it a personal statement or personal essay or something like that but it's a critical piece of graduate school application that tells the admissions committee who you are what are your academic and professional backgrounds and what are your interests and how you will add value to the university that you are applying for admissions professionals already have your transcripts they already have your resume they already have your test score so they already have your hard data so the statement of purpose is actually the chance for you to tell your story on your own words so uh, bear in mind that it should have around 500 to a thousand words um it must you must talk about your background explain what you hope to get out of the program address your unique features which could include soft skills and just keep it professional as well all right um you may want to also explain your expectations towards the program the university of your choice and also the career that you wish to pursue so when you start writing your statement of purpose, I suggest that you start with brainstorming. So ask yourself a few questions before you start writing your statement of purpose. So why does this program really interest me? Why did I choose this university? So what are my professional expectations? What are my academic expectations? What do I expect from the university and the program? And how will my unique professional and personal experiences add value to the program? Uh, how will completing this program impact my life? Do I want to change my career or maybe I just want to advance my career? So ask yourself those questions and you may want to make a draft, you know, just put these sensors on a paper. Just go brainstorming and taking notes and putting all these sensors on a paper because next you want to take those ideas and you want that, that you have identified before during the brainstorming process and you want to plug them into an outline they will guide you through the writing process so an effective outline of your statement of purpose might look something like this that you can see on the screen so first of all you have the introduction so uh you may want to start with an attention grabbing hook and a brief introduction to yourself, your background, as it relates to your motivations behind applying to the program. That's very important. So we need to know who you are, but we also need to know specific things that could relate to the university and to the program, right? And then you have the, the body of the, tech, the, of the um, statement of purpose. So that's where you, you actually write about your relevant experience and accomplishments um, that relates to the field. Once again, they have to be related to the field. And then you're gonna talk about your professional goals, why you're interested in the specific university, how you can add value to the university and how, and what exactly you're going to take from the program that you are applying to. And of course, we have the conclusion, which allows for a brief summary of the information presented in the body that emphasizes your qualifications and the compatibility with the university and the program you are applying to. So an outline like this will give you a roadmap to follow so that your statement of purpose is well organized and concise as well. Always, always review your statement of purpose before submitting it. This is very important. So as I mentioned before, it should be, uh, it should have 500 to 1000 words. So make sure to stick to that. Review grammar, vocabulary, punctuation, and you please review it multiple times. Review it once you're finished, review it again a few hours later. You might want to review it on the next day as well and ask someone you trust to read it for you as well. You know, because uh, we say that four eyes is actually better than one. So ask someone else to review it for you and ask not one, but maybe two people to review it for you as well, all right? And bear in mind that, oops, 
sorry about that. Uh, admissions decisions are actually made using an holistic approach. So that means that the admissions office will review the application and consider all the documents um, when considering the candidate. So let's say a strong recommendation letter. Actually, I have this, uh, doo -doo -doo. just one second. All right, I don't have that slide here. Sorry about that. But anyway, <laughs> I was talking about how the importance of uh, providing really strong support, uh, supporting documents. Just because let's say that a, you have a low GPA, but then you have a really great resume, you have really great strong recommendation letters, and you have provided a really good uh, and strong uh, statement of purpose. So that can actually help you overcome the low GPA. So use the soft data as a way for you to overcome any issues that you might have from the hard data, which means that, well, you already finished your, uh, your degree, your bachelor's degree, so you can't really change your grades, but you can actually change your, uh, the, like the university's uh, view of you by writing a really strong uh, statement of purpose as well, okay? Uh, and of course, we have some tips and suggestions for you. Let's just start with uh, doing your research. So review the university's website repeatedly. Ask for help if you need to narrow your options down. You may contact uh, students, alumni. Uh, you may contact, of course, academic counselors and organizations like Education USA and just review the website repeatedly and just plan your questions ahead. You know, you can also make a draft and brainstorming and just start writing all the questions that you have and don't, don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, uh, sometimes you might think like, oh my God, um, is this question like dumb or something like that? There is no such thing. So ask your questions and also, when watching uh, and participating on events like this, you, it will also give you more resources and ideas. So it's very important as well. And allow time for multiple drafts. So when, be, when you begin drafting content, content, just make sure uh, to provide insight on what drives you. Demonstrate your interest in the university by addressing unique features of the, the university and the program that you are interested. And just be yourself. Of course, it helps to keep your audience in mind while you're writing. Just remember that you are writing to the admissions office of a US-based university. You're not writing to your girlfriend. You're not writing to your family. So keep that in mind. Um, but don't forget to let your personality also shine through. Try to balance it. That's very important. So it's important to be authentic when writing your statement just to show the admissions committee who you are and why your unique perspective will add value to the program. And also take your time. If you don't feel creative today, that's fine. Stop right there, do something else. I don't know, have a great meal with your friends and family, go watch a movie, go for a walk or something like that, and then go back to your writing. That's perfectly fine. And of course, once again, um, if you need help, contact the University Education USA, attend all the events and watch videos and recorded sessions. And also when joining an event like the one that we're doing today, maybe someone else will ask like a question that at first did not cross your mind, but the answer actually could also be beneficial for you during the application process. So that's why it's very important to also join live events and tailor your letters accordingly. This is so important. Do not submit a letter to one university with another university's name on it. Believe me, that has happened before. Don't do that. And also don't send the same, the same letter to multiple universities. Universities are different, programs are different. So you need to provide different letters. So it's okay, you can actually, you can apply for multiple universities and I would actually encourage you to do so but please provide different documents to support your application. This is very important. Uh, and of course, avoid plagiarism. So plagiarism is basically a violation of intellectual property. It refers to the act of you 
taking the ideas of someone and pretending they are actually your own. So don't do that as well. It is unethical and your application will be dismissed if you do that. So remember, you need to write this statement of purpose using your own words. And I'm also gonna leave you with some questions just to make you think about yourself, your accomplishments and your goals. Uh, and actually, sometimes the student ask me, so what exactly are universities looking for in a candidate? So actually those questions will help you answer the, that, that question as well. So basically universities want students who will contribute to the university's community. So that includes collaborative thinking, being a constructive member of the class and of the university, uh, but it also means participating in research, projects, um, sports, and any extra activities promoted by the university. So that's what the university is looking for. So take your time to also see what you're doing that could actually fit in there. So am I participating in any activities in my community? Um, do I have a positive attitude? That's a really good one. Uh, how is my sense of community? Am I a leader? And that's fine if you're not a leader. I'm not a leader. That's fine because you can actually develop some leadership skills during your master's degree as well. And social responsibility. This is very important as well. Um, for instance, um, you may not know, but Northeastern is number two in the U.S. for diversity on campus, which means that we have students coming all around the world. And we do expect all of our students to show social responsibility towards local, domestic, and international students. So as I mentioned before, you will be able to network with your peers. And that includes local students from the US, but it will also include students from Latin America, uh, Europe, Asia, Africa, and all of that. So this is very important as well. And we really, like when we bring diversity on campus, it actually means more ideas and more project, projects coming. And that's actually very interesting. So uh, it's very important that you mingle and that you participate in every research and every project that you can so you can develop your networking skills. And maybe you will even have great connections that will lead you to important um, to career opportunities in the United States once you complete the program. So that's very important too, all right? Uh, I'm gonna open now just to questions that you might have. So do you have any specific questions about writing the statement of purpose or maybe you have some questions about the overall admissions uh, process uh, for university in the US? So please feel free, uh, you can raise your hands or you can type it on the chat box when whatever makes you feel more comfortable. Or you can speak it up too, go ahead. You can practice your English skills today as well. Okay, let me see if we have any questions here. Okay, Silvina, go ahead, you can ask your question. You can unmute yourself if you want. Yeah. Sorry if you can hear some noises, but I'm That's outside. That's perfectly like, fine. I have a big family, so. Um, so yes, I have a question related to the thesis of the statement. I was wondering if it's a good idea to cite, like to quote uh, authors or to quote someone, or I just uh -huh. stick to my very own ideas. Uh, you can quote someone, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure that you have all the information when quoting someone. All the information that we need is, of course, the quotation and also name of the person that you were quoting and where it was quoted. All right, so you need to provide complete information about that. Don't just quote someone just saying, you know, like, I don't know. I can't remember any quotes right now. Sorry about that. But <laughs> 
no quotes come to mind at this point, but you just, you can't really say the quote and just say the name of the person. Make sure to also write where it was quoted. Like, was it a, I don't know, the website or maybe the book, but you need to quote that too. Uh, we've seen uh, that there are a few students who uh, make some quotes in the end of in the beginning. That's perfectly fine. Just don't make quotes for everything. <laughs> don't make your like a big quote out of your statement of purpose. But yeah, you can definitely quote something or some quote someone, of course, uh, who inspires you. But then maybe you want to tell us why are you inspired? by that quote yeah like it needs to be related to to your ideas of course yeah exactly exactly <laughs> thank you and another yeah. question is that i took the TOEFL exam more than two years ago mm -hmm. and i know that it's usually valid for two years do you yes. think i should contact maybe the university to ask them if they they would accept it or or shall i take okay. it again you you can contact the university, but most likely they will tell you to take the okay. exam again just because it's expired. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So if I were you, I would just take the, the TOEFL again, or maybe if you're short on time, you can take the Duolingo test if, of course, the university accepts it. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And that's actually something that we can talk a little bit about as well, uh, the importance of providing really accurate and complete documents on your application. So uh, the admissions committee, they will not review your application if it's incomplete. All right. So sometimes we uh, like today, like five minutes ago, like five minutes before we started the meeting, there was a student from Turkey and she was actually asking, so I will submit the application tomorrow, but I still don't have my IELTS score. Will the admissions committee review me, my application? Answer is no, they will not. It will be marked as incomplete and you will be just, you know, sitting there. We are not gonna, going to move anything towards that application unless it's complete uh, in order to be reviewed. All right, so this is very important as well for everyone to know. But sometimes you, you need to also bear in mind that deadline, about the deadlines. So sometimes you don't have all the complete application or the, the complete documents by the deadline and you're like, okay, so I'm gonna submit half of it and I'll submit the rest of them in a month. It won't work. It has to be completed by the deadline. It's very important. All right. If you're unable to, you can also contact the university, of course, and try to, you know, overcome this and just try to explain to them why you haven't submitted all documents. But in general, just keep in mind that you need to submit complete documents in order for your application to be reviewed. And uh, maybe, and oh, of course, planning ahead, we will actually help you through this process as well, because you can actually prepare yourself academically, professionally, because maybe you want to take a break from work, or maybe uh, you decided to apply for the online program that you can take from your home country, so that's fine too. Uh, so planning yourself ahead, we will we actually help you through the process, and also, of course, prepare yourself financially as well. All right, so, uh, Sometimes students ask about scholarships. I know someone is going to ask about that at some point today. Uh, so basically, uh, of course, once again, it will vary from university to university. So you need to check with the university of your choice. But usually scholarships are provided on based on merit. So that means the admissions committee will consider your GPA, your English exam scores, your statement of purpose, uh, your resume, your professional background, and all of that, all right? Um, GPA is actually uh, on a scale of four. A strong GPA would be around 3.5 for a scholarship. And of course, once again, it will depend on the university. It will depend on the program that you are applying for. Some programs, they are really competitive. So nowadays, you can see that computer science programs, they are most competitive programs that any university offer. Uh, and I think it's actually, well, 
everything that we are doing and dealing right now, it refers to computer science at the end. Uh, so it's quite competitive. But if you're maybe applying to a program in science, it won't be that competitive. So it actually depends on the program that you apply for. So once again, contact the university of your choice, talk to your, uh, the academic counselor just to figure out what are the um, admissions criteria and scholarships criteria as well. All right. And um, GMAT and GRE, those are um, also um, exams which are required for graduate studies, um, not for all of the programs, but mainly for computer science, engineering, and business programs. Um, once again, check with the university of your choice, but at Northeastern, for instance, we are waiving GRE and GMAT because of the pandemic. So we are waiving them for uh, fall 22 and spring 22 as well, but it's November already. So might not have, you might not have time to apply for spring 22, which means that classes start in January. So unless you're applying for an online program, I would recommend that you apply for fall 22, just because you need to apply for your visa and all of that. All right. And I know I was actually talking to Carolina before uh, the meeting started, and we were talking about visas being issued in Argentina. So at this point, um, F1 visas and J1 visas, which are student-related visas, they are being issued regularly. Uh, those are the priority as, at, the, at this point, okay? So you should be fine with that. And do you have any more questions? Okay. So, all right. Um, I just wanted to mention something else. Uh, when you do your research about the university, um, it's good for you to check what sort of uh, career services and what sort of support to international students the university offers as well. So, for instance, at Northeastern, we have the Global Student Success, we have the Office of Global Services, which are offices that handle international students' requests. Uh, and of course, like I'm part of the International Enrollment Management Team. I do speak a little bit of Spanish, just so you know but I'd rather do it in, uh, in English. Uh, but uh, we do have uh, some staff members uh, that can actually reach out to you and clarify any questions that you might have, not only prior to the application process, but also once you're accepted to the program as well. So we have the Office of Global Services that provide support to international students when it comes to visa, um, issuing your I-20 and applying for the visa, employment opportunities, because so you know, uh, F-1 visa holders are allowed to work on campus part-time. So we have uh, support for that as well. Uh, so it's important for you as an international student to also search for those kinds of opportunities within the university that you wish to apply for. Right. It's very important for you to check that. Uh, of course, you will also have all the uh, support from Education USA, but you need support once you arrive on campus as well. So you can count on the Office of Global Services for that. Romina. Hi, wait, I lower the hand there. Thank you so much for the process and all the, the tips that you sure mm -hmm. showed with us. So uh, I understand for, for myself, I don't feel like a, that I have a relationship with the university, not when I am not in the university. So I obviously would need a lot of information. That's why we need to contact these this different exactly. institutions. But in order for me to, for example, to start grabbing all this content that I need and to follow up all the communications, maybe it's you like, because it's a long process, right? Maybe it takes a year. We don't know. We are online, the pandemic is here. We don't know if open, close, whatever. So mm -hmm. I feel that I am not right with all my documents. Mm -hmm. So if I feel like this, I can try, I will go for an online course, but what I see, how would you recommend, for example, maybe not for an MA or for a PhD, for, but for a program that has like maybe less the requisites so we can do it online, go, go on a process like, because we need to be inside the process to contact the university, but maybe not for something that will require a visa. 
applying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't feel right now in the, mm -hmm. in, maybe in my mind also to really travel abroad, put mm -hmm. all the things. So maybe it's also about, and mm -hmm. also financially. So like summing up, mm -hmm. The, understand the certificates I have, the you know the legal documents I need. Then for the visa, and all, all in all, it's like I would prefer for an online program with mm -hmm. less requisites. Yeah. Where is the right office, or what would be? How can uh -huh. I surf mm -hmm. through the internet and don't uh -huh. confuse myself? Understand? Because maybe I confuse myself saying like this is the program for me, but no, this is the program now you are talking about, and I I don't feel I have all the requisites. That right. Uh -huh. Where can I find? It? Is the extension programs or the non-degree programs maybe? Okay, so that's a really great question. So for the United States, basically you need to keep in mind that you're looking for graduate programs. So those are all post uh, bachelor's completion or anything like that. So you're looking for graduate certificates or master's degree or PhDs. So those actually hold a postgraduate diploma. All right, so when we say graduate certificate, we mean like postgrados in Argentina. You know, so um, the programs can actually last from eight months to one year to one academic year. Uh, so the duration is actually less than a master's degree. You can take them online as you can take the master's degree as well. It will depend once again on the, the university and the program of your choice, but you can see if that is also available online. Uh, when you are applying to an online program, yeah, it, it, actually the admissions requirements will remain the same. But of course, as you mentioned, you will not need to provide any extra documents when it comes to the visa. So you will not to need to provide, for instance, financial documents. All right, so it is required for the F1 visa, but it's not required if you're doing an online program from your home country. Right. Uh, so we, how to start the research. So you're doing the one good thing, which is joining us today. So watching videos and oh, just one thing that you mentioned when you start talking like that, you um, you wouldn't really feel connected to the university unless you're in the university. Uh, you know what? Universities actually have some open houses that are handled online. So you can actually have an idea of what it is to be on campus because you're going to be connected with faculty members and alumni and current students from the university. And I would say that connecting with current, current students is really, really important because then you can actually have an idea from a student perspective. Because of course, uh, me, Carolina, like we are actually, you know, we are working in the university, we're working in Education USA, so we have all the information that you need regarding academic, like academic process and all of that, but if you're talking to a student, you may have a feeling of, okay, so I'm applying to an online program, so how do you do that? So you're a student, you're currently attending an online program at Northeastern University, so how do you go about it? So do you usually study in the morning and how about the projects? How do you present the projects with your colleagues? So you can actually talk to one student and that's very important too. And when we say doing your research, it actually starts with going on the website of Education USA, just browsing through all the topics related, uh, read all the blogs, uh, read everything. And then you can actually, okay, so I'm interested in human resources, for instance. You can actually use our good old Google <laughs> and search for top ranked universities that are, that um, provides, um, sorry, just one second, my phone was ringing, um, that for top ranked university that provides uh, a great MS in human resource management or a graduate certificate in human resources management. And you can actually start from there. So go on the web to just look for all the requirements and just bear in mind that what you find on the institution's website, that is like, that's accurate. You know, you will find every information that you need on the institution's website, but sometimes you can actually be overwhelmed by so many information and you need more clarification on one topic 
or maybe okay so i understand that you have the graduate certificate in human resources but you have also the master's degree so what is the difference between those i read the curriculum i still don't get it so that's why you need to connect with education you say you need to connect with the university just to clarify all your concerns you know so that's very important uh, maybe the university has i don't know an a chat group on WhatsApp or something like that, or maybe um, they have a YouTube channel that you can actually watch some videos. Um, for instance, uh, I think it was yeah, on the end of September, we held a um, the graduate open house. So students were able to connect with faculty members, with students, with alumni, just to understand a little bit more about the program that they were interested in. So we have those recorded sessions. So go online, just watch the recorded sessions, because even watching the recorded sessions, maybe some students raised some concerns that will actually help you too. All right, so that's very important. So doing a lot of research is very important at this point, and also will help you prepare yourself to apply for the program. So maybe you notice that, I don't know, uh, I need to take the TOEFL exam. So how do I take it? And how do I prepare for that? I know the education we say provides something like that, right now preparing for the TOEFL, how to write it, uh, how to take the TOEFL exam and pricing and all of that. So it will help you to connect with them and to connect with us. So you can actually get further clarification on any queries that you might have about the programs. And also not, a, not only about the university and the program, but maybe about you know, the experience of actually taking the program. Yes, thank right. you so much, because yeah. it's it is a, just at, at the last minute, you just, just yeah. said that in, in, for instance, if we had to take the exam, right? Mm -hmm. It would be, I need to set up myself. It will be configurarme. Yes, mm -hmm. I need to set up myself to study, so to uh -huh. be a student in the U.S., inside exactly. the campus or university, but also to live in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Regarding that, for example, I have my previous uh, experience living and, and setting up myself in Beijing and then setting up myself in North of China with different master's degree. So I already have my, my degrees. Mm -hmm. But the difficulty when we go outside of Argentina sometimes is when we are not only a student, as a relationship. We understand that we apply for a scholarship or we apply for a program or a master's degree, a degree program or non-degree, but the way we set up in the community also mm -hmm. is, a, for example, if I go with all my documents, I apply and I, you know, I, I enter mm -hmm. the university. Do I get the opportunities or to see all the opportunities in the university or I have to do this before going to the university? What's the timetable for that too? For example, I speak four or five languages. Mm -hmm. I have all my documents legalized, but I couldn't do that, for example, in other in another two countries. They didn't allow me, you know? So but now- allow you to what exactly? To, to be a team, for example, a teacher assistant or oh, to okay, all right. Spanish, a Spanish uh -huh. department, like to be really bilingual, having a bilingual experience because mm -hmm. I thought I was looking for that, but okay. then, it, yeah, it, it really now with the pandemic, because all of my processes started in 2019 and with the pandemic, I had to stop. So imagine taking mm -hmm. my time for a year to set yeah. all the documents and now the pandemic stopped everything. So, yeah, uh -huh. but that's why I said maybe as I feel these uh, these programs that have our graduate programs, excellent programs. I've been to Education USA many times in many different mm -hmm. hotels in downtown and they go and <laughs> lots of universities come and you can ask everyone there. It was amazing. Yeah. Uh -huh. But from the Latin American point of view, but specifically from Buenos Aires, Argentina, I felt a little bit like it's only for graduate programs or it's only for these fields of programs. So maybe in the social sciences, in the languages or other areas, you maybe have more Mexican students, not Argentinians. Understand? Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> actually, but it's really specific. I know it's really uh -huh. specific. Yeah. Actually, when you think about uh, Latin America uh, students going, Latin American students going to the US, uh, the top three nationalities will be Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil. Not in their order, it's actually, it's Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia. All right. Uh, so, of course, 
we need Argentinians to come to, <laughs> to the US. Uh, but I guess it's mostly because of population as well. Like we would expect Mexico and Brazil to be on the top countries just because of the, you know, the population being so much larger than other um, Latin American countries. Uh, but aside from that, I would say that Colombia is number three, which is actually interesting because it's not about population then. You know, but it's not. So that's why we decided like, we really want to bring more diversity to campus. So that's why we're connecting with Education USA, uh, Argentina as well, and also other countries, uh, Peru. Uh, I've been connecting with um, Costa Rica, Panama and uh, uh, as well. Uh, but when it comes actually to social sciences, uh, humanities, uh, let's say business, we do have some um like american students but to tell you the truth we have more uh, domestic students on those yes mostly american citizens yeah because i see that for example sorry but uh -huh. the recommendation letters i i present most of the recommendations letters i present are from my directors or teachers or people that know me before the last 20 years uh, and they are all from social sciences or from language or from my degree. And mm -hmm. then I don't know if this is a request, if my referees, they need to have a relationship with the university or with the topic I'm interested to. No, a personal not actually. Or do, is not, not actually. Okay. No, so um, they have to be related to you. All right. So. It can be someone that you have worked with in the past, or your, uh, I don't know, maybe your um, supervisor or your coordinator on your previous uh, work experience or your current work experience. Uh, it could also be, let's say that you took your master's degree already and you took a bachelor's degree. So you could be a professor as well. So it needs to be related to you. And it, it needs to be someone who can speak on your behalf and speak well on your behalf, of course. Uh, for Northeastern, for instance, they don't really need to provide a letter of recommendation. They will need just to fill out a form online. So they will have guidance on what to write. You know, we're gonna ask them the specific questions that they need to answer. So they don't really need to provide a letter to us. All right. Uh, Thank you so yeah. much. No worries. Do you have any further questions? So I see that Carolina just shared the YouTube channel. So that's very important. I'm gonna share mine too. Let me just stop share. Yes, please do. So we're sharing information. <laughs> uh, always Education USA is the source um, for all your questions and concerns. You can go and watch the videos or join us at now we're different events. Mm -hmm. Also, let me just in here. Um, so, for instance, at Northeastern, we have nine colleges and we have, of course, some other offices. So on the link that I shared, you can see some YouTube channels for some specific colleges and also alumni and all of that. You know, just just go through it. Just watch the videos on your own time, you know, because that's a good thing about videos. You can just, you know, just put it on your uh, earplugs and just go do your thing and just just uh, hear it, so that's fine too, right? And of course, if you have any questions, you can please feel free to reach out to us at any time. Uh, let me just share here. Um, ta -da. You got some contact information here as well. Please feel free to reach out at any time. Uh, the number that you see on the screen is actually WhatsApp number. All right, and we also have the email, which is latam at northeastern.edu. You're going to be talking to me specifically on that WhatsApp number and also on the email. So please feel free to reach out as well if you need any specific information about Northeastern University. All right. And all right. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. It was really nice conversation that we had at the end. So that was a really good thing also. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, thank Marina, you so for taking the time. And thank you, Romina and Silvina, for joining us. And we know other people will be watching the recording as well. I'm sorry, Silvina, you want to say something? Yeah, uh, thank you. And I guess we're both looking forward to, to meet it again, maybe in another opportunity to, to learn about um, other requirements. That would be awesome. 
Sure, from Education USA, Argentina, we have different events. We advise you to follow us on, on social media, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Uh, we're always posting everything we're doing right there. So join, join us in social media and you will learn about everything we're doing. Yes, absolutely, budget plan. And we pretty much um, take care of the entire process, bits by bits. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was Thank amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great All day. Right. I'm going to stop Let's recording see. right now. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you, everyone. So.